Yeah, thank you, Katie. Uh, and now, without any further ado, um, let's jump straight into the midst of it. Um, last week, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released the Working Group 2's contribution to their big report. And the Working Group 2 contribution looks at the impact of climate change on ecosystems, on biodiversity, but also on the communities at global and regional levels. And the outlook is, as expected, bleak. Um, however, the greater tourism and hospitality sectors they have, we've seen momentum, in fact, over the past little while with commitments such as the Glasgow Declaration on Climate Action in Tourism and the release of various roadmaps towards net zero by 2050. So what's happening here? Uh, are our effort actually paying off or not? So let's find out and turn to our opening keynote speaker. He is the director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. He's advisors to the World Economic Economic Forum, as well as the United Nations Framework on uh, Convention on Climate Change. He is very agile on the many topics surrounding the state of our planet. And today we have the honor to welcome him with this opening keynote called Holding the 1.5 Degrees Celsius Line Towards a Sustainable Tourism Industry. Let's welcome Professor Dr. Johann Rockström. All right, so thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning uh, in Berlin, Professor Rockström. I would say the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Willie. And uh, it's a great pleasure and really important to be with you and the hospitality community at this moment. We live in turbulent times, turbulent times where we hopefully are at the tail end of one crisis, the pandemic. We're in the midst of a second crisis, the climate and ecological crisis. And we're right now also suffering from the violent war in Ukraine and everything is interconnected. We must recognize that shutting down the pipelines of gas and oil, rising energy prices across the world, affecting the hospitality industry has all to do with now stability, security and peace in the world. And this is an effort now trying to give you an update of this interconnectedness with a focus, of course, on the climate science. And we've come to a point, scientifically, where we now need to recognize the risk of destabilizing all life support systems on Earth. You mentioned, Willie, the IPCC 6 assessment, the sharpest language so far coming last Monday on the day of the invasion of Ukraine with these high-level messages. Quite remarkable. The science is today unequivocally showing that we're threatening human well-being and we're putting the health of the entire planet at risk and that the window is really shutting. If we don't have urgent action by the global community now, we will shut the window of a livable future for humanity on Earth. But it's not only that. The climate science now shows clearly it's all about the planetary boundaries. It's not only about decarbonizing fossil fuels, it's also about reconnecting to nature and investing in the resilience and the capacity of nature to deliver both adaptive capacity and sinks. So here we are, and let's take the journey. We are today at 1.2 degrees Celsius of global warming, the warmest temperature on Earth, in fact, since we left the last ice age 12,000 years ago and entered the civilizational journey as we know. We've crashed through the world's the roof already in climate stability. We're actually today following a pathway that scientifically is a pathway to disaster. We have an average future of 2.7 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. It's a place we haven't been in for the past four to five million years. Even if all the pledges in Glasgow at COP26 are implemented, net zero pathway to 2050, methane pledges, deforestation halting pledges, the national determined contributions updates, we could potentially take us just below two degrees, a point of danger. Because the latest science, what you see to the left here, shows that even 1.5 degrees Celsius warming could make us move from moderate risk to high risk to trigger irreversible changes of tipping points. And we're studying these very closely. But the IPCC also shows that extreme events, which was referred to earlier here, the devastating floods right now in Australia, the devastating floods last year in Germany, the disease patterns, heat waves, water scarcity, are not only becoming more severe, they're also becoming more frequent, attributed to human change. And just a little reminder that things happen fast, but also slowly. Already at 1.5 degrees Celsius warming, the IPCC concludes with a high likelihood that on the long term, sea level rise will reach above two meters. 
At two degrees Celsius, you see here, it may be between two and six meters. A massive impact on hundreds of millions of people, livelihoods in coastal regions, but of course, a major impact on the hospitality industry. But let's look at the long term. This is the latest map, unpublished yet, of the so-called tipping elements that we scientifically know today contribute to regulate the stability of the Earth system. Now, if you look carefully at these, you have many hosted beautiful hospitality locations here. We're talking the coral reef systems, we're talking all the grasslands, the temperate forest, the rainforest in the Amazon. And these have tipping points. If you push them too far through global warming, overexploitation of nature, pollution, they risk crossing tipping points and irreversibly move from being our best friend and dampening and cooling to delivering more amplified negative trends. We today show that the risks of pushing these too far are coming dangerously low, close to the temperatures we are at today. What you see here is the best estimate from science in an uncertainty range with the so-called red embers diagrams, the redder, the higher the risk, where you can see that already at two degrees Celsius warming, we are at risk of crossing tipping points in Greenland, in tropical coral reef systems, in the West Antarctic ice shelf. So there's really a strong warning from science. But not only that, we have an emerging evidence that everything is so interconnected. If the Greenland ice sheet, which is now melting so fast, releases cold water in the North Atlantic, it slows down the whole Gulf Stream system, which in turn pushes the monsoon further south, which can explain less rainfall over the Amazon, which can explain why we have more forest fires and droughts, but also that we have more warm water locked into the Southern Ocean, which accelerates the melting of the West Antarctic ice shelf. So the Arctic is connected with Antarctica. And again, the hospitality industry is located across all geographies on the planet. So we have to really look at this seriously. And this is a paper that came out also just last week, showing that a large parts of the Amazon rainforest is losing resilience very fast. Those are the red spots you see here, meaning losing the capacity to deal with stress. So the window is open, but barely. The IPCC confirms this. So here you see the red embers diagram from the release report just last week, showing again that at two degrees Celsius, we are at risk of pushing large ecosystems and, and tipping elements across thresholds. Just look at the tourist industry, how this is affected. You see here an estimate from the IPCC on North America, where at the two degree point, you see this dark red, high risk, scientific, high confidence level for the tourist industry. So tourist industry is just like agriculture, forestry, and the other sectors, you know, being hit by impacts earlier than we've previously thought. When you dig a little bit deeper into this, you can go into different sectors. Just look at skiing and the whole dependence on seasonality on snow, which is now climbing down at risk of one degree Celsius. We are already today losing stability of resorts and hospitality for skiing. So this is an area of deep concern already today. In this part of the world, in Germany, we have more and more scientific evidence showing that the number of tourist days for, for flood-based tourism on the Donau will be reduced by, you know, not single days, but up to 10 to 20 days a year because of extreme flooding events across the basin. The hospitality industry has a big responsibility here. It contributes an estimated 4.5 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalents each year in emissions. As you see, it's half of it is transport. Not surprising. This is a big number. It's actually half of the largest emitter in the world, namely food system, which is at roughly 8 billion tons. So the, the hospitality industry is, is part of, of the solution if it can move to carbon positive and nature positive. But the trajectory to the future does not look very good. Just look here at the international travel and domestic travel, which is projected just to increase because of larger industry, but also the question of whether the hospitality industry will be able to transition. So we need to look at the whole planet. Is it time to become stewards? We have developed a scientific framework for this, the planetary boundary framework, showing the nine big systems we have to be stewards of to keep the hospitality industry, the world, on track within a safe operating space of stability on Earth. We're passed for climate, but also biodiversity, land use, nitrogen, phosphorus, and very likely also on chemical pollution, published recently in a paper just a few weeks back. So five of nine boundaries are on the wrong side of the fence. And it's a sustainability transition we're talking about. It's not only about carbon positive, it's about keeping nature's climate 
carbon sequestration capacity intact. So it's nature positive and climate positive. It's a sustainability journey we're looking at. And what you see here is the IPCC summary of this, which is showing this clearly. We cannot disconnect climate from nature. But the journey on climate is extraordinary. Just look at these graphs of what China, United States, European Union, India is in for to reach zero by 2050 to 2060. Too slow for science, but just look at the pace. We're talking about 7 to 10% reductions per year. That's what must happen. Can we do it? Well, actually, science increasingly shows that yes, it's not utopian. We can wedge by wedge, sector by sector, here an example from the exponential roadmap work, but you have the Drawdown Project, you have other initiatives, the International Energy Agency is showing that yes, it is possible to reach net zero in time to hold the 1.5 line, but it requires massive action from all sectors today. And that is a necessity, a prerequisite to reach the sustainable development goals. The aspirational targets of human well-being, zero poverty, zero hunger, and good economic development, good health for all people in the world. But these have a scientific consequence because four of the, of the sustainable development goals of the 17 are non-negotiable. They're planetary boundaries on freshwater, goal six, 13, 14, 15 on oceans, climate, and biodiversity. We need to recognize that the tourist industry, the economy must now operate within these boundaries, place them inside the safe operating space of planetary boundaries, and we have a chance of a future together. But it requires transformations. The tourist industry is right at the middle across all these transformations that we need to see so fast. And the economy must be placed inside planetary boundaries, as shown by the Sirpartha Das Gupta review on economics of biodiversity. So we have the tools today of how to price doing wrong, giving value for natural assets today. So finally, handing back to you, Willie, it's a really pivotal moment right now. We're right at this edge. Will we tip over in the right direction or will we continue, as we've done for the past 50 years, on incremental change? Many times in the right direction, but much too slow. So let's move together really fast. Back to you, Willie. Thank you very much. Uh, this was an amazing uh, uh, insights, actually, Prof. Uh, Hochschirm. So if, if we get this right, we often talk about um, climate adaptation and climate mitigation, also in the tourism sector. This is, these are topics that are uh, very present. It's almost as if we're trying to avoid the unmanageable, but also prepare to manage the inevitable, which is mm. what really comes out of this. Uh, perhaps there's a question on the macro aspects, considering the, the geopolitical situation that we're having here. Uh, can we expect a fast-track move movement now in a transformation away from fossil fuel uh, it, it, because of the current situation. Is that what's happening uh, around the globe, or particularly here in the EU? Yeah, well, you're right that there is a, an, an interesting potential paradox in this, in this devastating disaster we're seeing right now, that, that it is a reminder of the risks of being too dependent on autocratic states for delivery of, of cheap energy from fossil fuels. And, and I think this is a very, I mean, science has been warning for this for decades and, and really pushing for not only renewable, uh, zero carbon, sustainable energy sources, but also for independence from, you know, states, not necessarily Russia, but from Libya, from Iran, from Iraq, uh, to, to be able to have that energy independence. Now we're seeing an oil embargo from the Biden administration. I hope we'll see that from the European Union as well. Germany is a very challenging position here, but hopefully we'll see that occurring. And, and that's interesting. The IPCC also emphasizes that now is the time to integrate mitigation and adaptation into what they define as climate resilience. And that this is the pathway to, you know, we're beyond adaptation. We now need zero carbon adaptive capacity. And that is one part of that is independence yeah. on energy. It's independence, yes. I think we'd like to take one question from the audience, and I will read. Uh, Prof. Roxham, you said everything is interconnected. How can a single entrepreneur in the travel tourism sector contribute on an individual basis? Yes, thanks. So that's, a, that's a really good question. Well, to begin with, what we're facing is, is I mean, fundamentally a system failure. So, of course, any individual cannot solve a big system failure. So I think entrepreneurs in the hospitality industry, uh, you should make your voice heard, so to say, like, the, like you're doing here, and, and thereby putting pressure on, on finance and policy and, and the big decisions. But of course, every entrepreneur can also walk the talk themselves and try to be as much carbon positive, nature positive as possible. 
But I think increasingly also have the conversation alive. If you're running a really good hospitality business, try to get your customers to, to be you know, informed and, and, and made enthusiastic over why sustainability is making the experience so much more valuable and, and kind of make this a conversation across the whole world. That's right, especially since this is an industry that relies heavily on all the processes for nature, the food provision and so on. And I know you've done some work as well on the food side uh, in relation to, to, to climate. Uh, perhaps we have time to for one last question from uh, the audience. Uh, what measure should the hospitality industry take in order to become carbon neutral until 2050? As a matter of fact, this is a topic we'll be talking uh, about today. I don't know if you have a, a quick insights here, but... Um, you know, my... my advise here to begin with is to science has advanced a, a quite a nice simple framework for this that we call the carbon law the carbon law says if you can cut emissions by half every decade you actually follow the scientific pathways yeah. to net zero that's a quite interesting simple law because it can be scaled you know you can do it i can do it a company can do it a country can do it the world can do it it's it's inspired by the moore's law so it's a kind of an innovation uh, exponential solutions idea um, this is uh, the science-based target initiative, which is the biggest growing company effort of following science to net zero, has adopted the carbon law. So join the SBTI, adopt the carbon law, and start working across scope one, two, and three from the supply chain, your production, and consumer use to try and follow that pace. And, and the good thing with that is that it doesn't mean that you have to solve everything overnight, That's right. but you have to reduce emissions, you know, roughly around 7 to 10 percent per year and i think that is when you when you look at the numbers most businesses can do that i can do that thank you so much and that, that is the perfect link to the following uh, sessions we'll be having on destinations in hospitality and mobility of course uh, professor Ekstrom, it's been a pleasure to welcome you here today at the itb berlin we wish you the best success of course and uh, continued enthusiasm for the work that you're doing uh, on climate science thank you so much for attending today it's been thanks a pleasure thanks